before joining the University of McGill. He was an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Toronto, a Bolton Fellow at McGill University, and a research associate at the European Un University Institute in Florence. Professor Maigret is the author of Le Tribunal Penal International pour le Rwanda, and he is currently co-editing the second edition of the United Nations and Human Rights, a critical appraisal with Professor Philip Austin. So let me introduce to you the speaker of Never Again, The Challenge of Stopping Genocide, Professor Frédéric Maigret. Thank you very much, uh, Evan, for the uh, introduction, and, and thanks to Wesk and uh, Professor uh, Grossman for uh, inviting me today. I'm uh, very pleased and, and honored. I actually welcome the opportunities that uh, we have at McGill to uh, interact with CIGEP uh, students. I've always found that to be uh, a very fruitful kind of uh, encounter. Um, so I don't know how much you know about uh, genocide and genocide prevention, so what I am proposing to do is sort of give you a broad introduction and then really open the floor for uh, debate. I think the, the starting point here is we're not doing particularly well. Uh, I think the, um, the, the ambition after the Second World War was, was the ambition of never again. Uh, that something uh, uh, similar to the Holocaust would be avoided at all costs. And in fact, the whole United Nations Charter was part of an effort to make sure that this wasn't repeated. Um, and although I, I don't think we've had anything close to the Holocaust, we have had large-scale uh, uh, man-created, man-caused uh, loss of life, you can think, for example, of the, uh, the killing fields of uh, Cambodia, uh, closer to us in 1994, 800,000 people uh, being killed uh, in the space of, uh, of less than a month in uh, Rwanda, uh, fairly large-scale massacres in the former Yugoslavia, uh, very significant loss of life in Darfur, um, and of course today what we're dealing with uh, in Syria. So we have uh, what seems to be a recurring uh, problem, and a problem that we have turned out not to be as good at addressing as we would have liked. And I think that raises moral questions about, uh, you know, about our failures, about what we could have done better. It raises political questions, questions of uh, will, of our ability to sort of muster political resources to deal with uh, this violence as it occurs. Uh, and it also raises, and I'm a law professor, so it's a part of what I'm interested in, legal uh, uh, questions. And uh, among the legal questions is, is you know, what should the international community be doing when genocide has been committed? You should be accountable for genocide having uh, occurred. Obviously, the law is only a, a small part of the, uh, of the answer, but the adoption of a genocide convention, the main treaty on genocide in 1948, was supposed to set uh, a framework. And so one of the, what I'll be trying to show is what has happened to that framework. So we have a problem which is, I wouldn't say that genocide is mysterious. I think we have a better understanding, uh, probably better understanding than ever of uh, why or how genocides happen, but there, there's still, um, I think, a lot to understand, uh, a lot to learn. Uh, it, it, it is not the process by which uh, certain people, certain groups, uh, decide that their sort of existence on you know, the surface of the earth depends on them uh, destroying a, a, another group is, uh, is, is mysterious uh, in some ways, but I think we don't uh, always fully understand what's involved. And of course, if you want to avoid genocide, uh, you need to understand where they're coming from and uh, uh, find tools that are, that are adequate. So I don't know if we can ever fully stop genocide, but certainly this has been on the international community's agenda for many decades, and really the international community would not be much of, a, of an international community if it 
allowed the sort of continued uh, uh, occurrence of such events. All right, so the first thing you have to do, and here maybe I'm speaking a little bit as a lawyer, is you have to know what you're dealing with. Uh, and that's a little complicated, right? Because genocide is a term that's sometimes tossed around uh, a little freely. There's a bit of a danger with that. If you start describing everything as genocide, any massacre, uh, you kind of devalue the, the term, right? You trivialize it, right? So you want to keep this for events that are really among, you know, I think what the international community had in mind in 1945 is we're really talking about something quite extraordinary. Uh, and uh, so, you know, what is it that makes, that allows us, for example, to distinguish genocide from all kinds of phenomena, right? And from uh, massacres or pogroms, atrocities, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, genocide, right? How is genocide different from all these other terms, right? Can anyone tell me of those terms, which are legal terms and which are just sort of social, scientific, or sort of general discourse terms? What are the legal terms? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to be asking you a few questions. So. Anyone? If you ra all raise your hands at the same time, it's going to be difficult. So. All right. Cool. Yeah, make a guess. They're both legal terms, right? War crimes defined in the Geneva Convention, and we know genocide, we're pretty sure of that, right? It's in the Genocide Convention. There's another one. Crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity, a bit peculiar. There's no treaty on crimes against humanity, but it's sort of was created by the Nuremberg Tribunal. It certainly exists in international law. So that's a first way of separating those, right? Massacres, sort of a, you know, it's a pretty vague term. It's, it's, it's literary or journalistic. Atrocities typically describes uh, sort of mass crimes committed against people, against sort of groups. Uh, humanitarian crimes, right? So, so you could say the crime of aggression when a state attacks another state is not really an atrocity. It's a crime by one state against the state, right? But atrocities are sort of crimes committed, large crimes committed against people. Uh, and then there's ethnic cleansing, which is, you know, a term that emerges in the 1990s. And ethnic cleansing is basically the pushing out of a people from the territory where they ordinarily uh, live to another territory for the purposes typically of creating ethnically or racially homogeneous territories, right? So the term obviously emerges in, or not that obviously emerges in the 1990s in, the, in relation to Bosnia and what the Serbs in Bosnia were trying to do at the time, which was to sort of empty all these sort of uh, Bosnian villagers, uh, their inhabitants, to create a sort of greater Serbia, right? Um, so I think there's, uh, uh, you know, some ambiguity there. And let me just flag the ambiguity. Sometimes people will say genocide uh, when they really only mean atrocities or massacres, right? Um, and there is a uniqueness to genocide. With, and can anyone guess, or does anyone know, what is special about genocide that none of the others have, right? Yep. So it is definitely always directed towards a particular group, but that could be shared with, with others. So war crimes are directed at civilians. And you can say, well, civilians are a particular group. Right? And you could commit a crime against humanity against a religious group. Right? Uh, in fact, that used to be a requirement of crimes against humanity. So it's a starting point, but what else must there be? So there has to be a particular group. So that's a really interesting point. So the number of people has something to do with it, uh, although I think today we've kind of, we try to move a little beyond that in law by saying that, you know, 
you can be a very unsuccessful genocide, if that makes any sense. But you sort of, you only end up, uh, it, you know, this is, I'm obviously quite somber, but you, you only kill like 10% of a group, it, and it might be a very small group. So it's a, a small indigenous group in the Amazonian, right? There's only 100 members. Might still count as genocide, even though it's a small percentage of what's in the absolute, a quite small number. Okay, so there's some, it's not the numbers per se that matter, yes. All right, so targeted against a group with a view to destroying that group, right? So that's what, what you're, you're trying to do, right? Is whatever it is you're doing, it has to be consistent with the desire to uh, destroy the group as such, right? Um, so obviously if you, and it could be only a part of a group, but it's, that element is crucial. Yes. Not necessarily. Uh, so because the group could be, as, as we're going to get into to, to the question of the groups, but it, it you know, might not be, I suppose you're thinking of a racial group, it doesn't have to be a racial group. So in short, you have to be targeting a group with, uh, and doing things that go to the destruction of that group. And most importantly, you have to have the intent to destroy the group as such. So what's particularly evil about the crime of genocide is that you set out to wipe that group from the face of the earth. Okay? And that's what distinguishes it from, for example, crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity, you might commit, it might, you might be you know, putting a group into slavery, um, ethnic cleansing, you are pushing a, a group outside its territory, but in neither case do you have a specific intent to destroy the group as such. So that's worth pondering for a second, right? The kind of perversity that lies in political projects that determine in advance that they want to destroy the group as such. It doesn't happen all the time. I mean, some, you know, in, in wars, uh, you know, quite often parties will be content with just defeating the enemy, uh, occasionally terrorizing their civilians. Obviously not a good thing to do, but not quite the same thing as saying, we're gonna take this and by the time we're done, there will be not a single member left. Okay? So I think historically there's a sense that, obviously I think, as a result of the experience of the Holocaust, but even before that, the, uh, the, the massacre of the Armenians, and possibly even before that, has anyone, any predecessors to, even before the, the sort of the Ottoman Empire massacres uh, of the Armenians, has anyone, any of you who do history, that's a kind of, yes? A, uh, well, the question is, what's the, uh, uh, something that came before, but would be kind of genocidal, I mean, arguably this has been going on in the history for, for thousands of years, right? I don't think genocide is a purely modern phenomenon. Uh, it, it, obviously the Holocaust was peculiar because of uh, the industrial level uh, uh, to which things were taken, but massacres, a, aiming, targeting an entire group where in you know, quite frequent. You might not know it, but, and I, I mention it, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's quite relevant. In the context of colonization, Germany had a colony in Africa, in Namibia, okay? Namibia, what is now Namibia. And there was an ethnic group there called the Hereros, who basically rose up against the sort of a, the Prussian colonizer, and orders came from Berlin to basically right, wipe them out completely. Uh, and that's basically what happened. I mean, 90% of the group was destroyed. Uh, so it's interesting to note that this has origins in colonization. Uh, you know, you, you, you could also make an argument there's something genocidal about slavery, you're certainly destroying the group as such. What's interesting about the idea of destroying the group as such is something you want to destroy a group. You destroy the members of the group, right? I mean, if you just kill a lot of members of a the group, there's not much of a group left. But you could also target 
things among the group that make the group a group, right? So let's say, imagine you were a group and I could sort of destroy your common culture or your language or your means of subsistence or your, your, your village, your city, right? So you can target the group, but you can ta a group is, more, is always more than just the sum of its individuals, right? A group is, is, is an entity and we kind of keep humans uh, held together by all kinds of, of uh, cultural, social uh, uh, bounds that, that can be targeted as such. All right. The idea of genocide, does it, what, who does, is that still taught ancient Greek? Does anyone sort of uh, know what genocide is etymologically, what it goes back to? What does side mean? To kill, okay? Uh, and genos... Yeah, some, yeah, exactly. So a sort of uh, a, 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 a group that, that's, uh, that, that could be, I mean, essentially one of those groups, a sort of racial and ethnic group. Um, this is... Interesting, this is a term that doesn't exist, right? So we have a crime that is being committed, but there's no name for it. Right? Um, you know, people, with the, even when the Armenians uh, uh, were massacred and were massacred in droves, the, the states at the time and lawyers didn't really quite know what to call it. They said, well, they're sort of acts of barbarism and they're crimes against the conscience of humanity, but there was no real treaty and, you know, frankly, at the time, states were, had other things on their mind. So in the 1940s, obviously, um, you know, reports are start, starting to come out. Uh, we knew the Nazis were anti-Semitic, right? They adopted the Nuremberg Laws in 1933. Jews could no longer work, could no longer marry non-Jews. You know, so there's no doubt that things were bad, but the final solution was decided, you know, later, and it wasn't, you know, obvious, obvious to all involved that something as dramatic as the Shoah would be, uh, was involved. So reports are starting to come out from the, in the Jewish diaspora, uh, among the Allies, they're noticing trains that seem to go to places where there's no real military reason for them to go, etc. Diplomats on the ground uh, are noticing things, and there's uh, 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 Raphael Lemkin is a, 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 a former law professor in uh, Poland, uh, a Jewish emigre or refugee rather in New York, and he's trying to make sense of all this. And I think he, he's a he's a weird character. He's a bit isolated in New York. He doesn't know many people, and he becomes completely obsessed. And he has this intuition but something really, really bad is happening. Right? Um, now that's quite extraordinary, right? Because it takes a lot of sort of piecing things together. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to, you know, even thinking that this would be possible. And it says we need to punish for people who are doing this. Uh, and his proposal in order to punish it is, we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it genocide. Uh, and we can have an international treaty and we can have an international tribunal and you know people will be prosecuted uh, you know, I mean ideally we'll sort of do what we can to stop this in its tracks but in addition there will have to be a day of reckoning so he goes around and he's proposing you know his uh, his draft of a genocide convention and little by little he gets the attention of uh, the allies and so um, Basically, the, uh, the treaty isn't ready uh, for the Nuremberg trial. The Nuremberg trial happens in, you know, right after the Second World War. Um, and, you know, the senior Nazis who've been caught are prosecuted, but they're prosecuted for crimes against peace and war crimes and a bit crimes against humanity. But genocide doesn't actually make it to the Nuremberg uh, trial. So very weird, because today we would think, well, you know, surely the Holocaust was you know, by, sort of in, by far the worst thing that happened in the Second World War. But at the time, the sort of the Allies are a little behind um, and they focus on aggression, you know, sort of the Nazis invading Czechoslovakia uh, rather than the genocide as such. 
1948, though, things have changed, and they're, they're, you know, there's, there's a, a greater appreciation that something historically unprecedented uh, and, and atrocious, and that really sort of shatters the, the boundaries of morality, of uh, humanity, of law, has happened, and, and this is going to be a very defining moment. All right, but if you're a lawyer, you need to define me. And the trick, whenever you're trying to define something in law, is to not be over including right? To not have a definition that's so broad that it could include all kinds of things that, you know, are maybe not as grave, but not under-inclusive either. You don't want to miss something. So there's two challenges, right? Uh, well, two or three, but uh, the first one is um, you'll, well, you'll notice the intent, right? So very interesting that the most defining part of the element is the intent. It's not so much what you do, it's what you do it for, okay? Because you could be killing a group with or without the intent, right? In one case, it might just be a war crime or crime against humanity. In the other case, it's genocide. Right? So the intent is going to be very important to destroy in whole or in part. It has to be in part, right? Um, you know, that, that, that uh, um, you, know, you might not think that you'll ever be able to destroy the entire group because there's too many of them, you know, but your intent is to destroy as many as possible. Right? It's good enough for genocide, right? That can't uh, be decisive. All right, then it becomes a little more tricky because you have to define the group. What is a group, right? So this could be pretty extensive, right? Are you a group? for the genocide convention purposes? Clearly not, right? You're not, certainly you're, you're not one of us, unless it's something I don't know, right? But, uh, but there are all kinds of groups in society. It's, you know, conceivably in any armed conflict, in any war, groups are being, you know, they could be the group of people who live in that neighborhood, right? In Syria, for example, but they're not, one of the groups that the Genocide Convention has highlighted as particularly necessary to protect, national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups. Okay? It's a list, like all lists, maybe it's missing something. What is it missing? If you're thinking of wars, All right, um, think of a Cambodian genocide. Think of the um, Ukrainian, yes, political affiliation, right? There's a, a, a lot and a lot of people who've been killed because historically in the 20th century, for example, because they're part of a certain political group. Right? Um, so, you know, Cambodia it would be sort of uh, pretty much anyone in Cambodia who's not with the Khmer Rouge, whatever. They may not even be a political group. They're just sort of, you know, the, the other Cambodians who are not, uh, who are seen as a threat to the emerging regime. Um, and, you know, you're going to have, so it's the Soviets who say we don't want to include political groups, because that's too wide, but probably, you know, others are quite happy to go with that. All right, so we've got national, ethnical, racial, religious. I won't go into the details of that. I mean, I think sometimes people try to rationalize it by saying, well, with all these groups, they're sort of groups that you belong to by birth, right? And you have no say, right? So your racial group, you're sort of born into a racial group. You're born into an ethnic group, etc. Uh, political groups, it's a bit different. You choose your political uh, opinions, and so, you know, there's something particularly nasty about targeting people just because of who they are, and when those are sort of characteristics that they had no choice in. But that actually doesn't really work, because national, you could change nationality. Religious, you know, surely you're not sort of just born into a religion. I mean, you might be, but you could decide to move in and out of a religious group. So it's not absolutely clear uh, that that works. I think what a lot of people say is these are groups that are pretty stable over time. 
even if they're not by birth, they, they're kind of, you know, they have a sort of organic quality. They're, um, they're not sort of that contingent. All right, and these are the things that you do to those groups, right? So you have the intent, you have a group, and these are the things that you do to the group. Uh, obviously, killing its members, exterminating its members, is uh, the most evident. But look at some of these others, right? So deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. That's kind of interesting, right? Uh, we could think of, you know, the, the government in, in Ethiopia in the 1980s basically organizing a famine, right, to sort of uh, uh, in areas that were not faithful to the regime, right? You're not killing them, but you're, you know, sort of stopping the, uh, the irrigation and the taps and you're, you're creating a situation where they're going to die slowly. Same thing. Um, but there's this whole kind of obsession with with births and sort of you know sort of taking children and and putting them in another group what does that remind us of in Canada yeah residential schools right uh, I mean legally there, there's an issue you know the genocide convention you know maybe didn't exist uh, at the time this started but you can see that it is that's one of the ways in which you destroy the group, right? You take the children away, you force them to speak another language than the language of their ancestors in two or three generations, you've destroyed the groups, right? The group as such. You know, they might still be descendants, they might still be people, but they no longer belong to the group and the group has sort of atrophied into non-existence. All right. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, you know, skip those, but but sometimes you'll hear historians or political scientists, you know, there's a kind of consensus that, you know, they were, well, the consensus isn't even much for consensus. People say, well, there were four genocides or three genocides in the 20th century. And, you know, the Armenians, the Holocaust, and Rwanda, and possibly Cambodia, right? Um, and so the idea there seems to be that these are genocides because they're particularly large scale, uh, and, you know, they're, they're sort of extremely well known in history. Right? Arguably, there's been more. I mean, arguably, right, if you set out, even as, as a private individual, to destroy a group, you have this plan over years to kind of destroy a group. It might be a very small group, say one small indigenous tribe, um, you could be committing genocide, right? And arguably, they are, there is behavior that is genocidal, even though historians might not conclude that there had been a genocide, uh, sort of overall, right? So in, this was a big issue in Bosnia, right? Was there a genocide in Bosnia? Well, we have a lot of the elements, right? We have Bosnian Muslims who are targeted by the Serbs, okay? Um, a lot of the things that, that are being done to them are consistent with a desire to destroy the group as such. I mean, among other things, a lot of them are being killed, most notoriously in the Srebrenica massacre, right? We're talking about, you know, as many as 8,000 men being gunned down in the hills of Srebrenica, pursued, you know, executed, etc. But there's a, you know, so the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia recognized that Srebrenica specifically was a genocide. And then, but for the rest of Bosnia, there was more of a, a debate, because some people are saying, well, they were only trying to do ethnic cleansing. They were kicking Bosnia Muslims out of their villages. But that's not really, that's bad. Crime against humanity, you know, ethnic cleansing, but it's not quite genocide, because if you're just pushing, you know, moving people out, out of their territory, you're not destroying them as such, right? So it's, it's a little different. So there's a, a debate there. Um, and this is, you know, this is, I think, a recurring problem, right? If you, in a sense, I'm not saying we, we're putting all our eggs in the same basket, but we've said genocide is particularly great, right? And genocide justifies a particularly strong reaction from the international community. Um, so the next thing, you know, that's, that's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of debates 
on whether this is a genocide or isn't a genocide. And people will be very disappointed when, you know, the Commission of Inquiry on Darfur, for example, concludes that they can't determine with certainty that it is or isn't a genocide. Right? And then it seems as if if it's not a genocide, nothing's going to happen, which isn't, uh, um, you know, which isn't true, but is often thought by, by, by people. Um, so, I mean, these, uh, these debates about definition have real consequences. And today, you know, often if you want to draw attention to your cause, you're going to want to sort of dramatize it by saying, well, it's not just ethnic cleansing, this is a genocide, right? Um, okay. All right. So this is where it becomes, so I'm going to talk about prevention. I have now established more or less what genocide is, right? So how do you prevent it? Um, this is the, the talk of our moment. I mean, it's been for a while, right? But uh, ideally, we don't want to be just punishing people who've committed genocide. It's a bit late, you know? Think of Rwanda, right? Well, it's great. The Rwanda Tribunal has prosecuted 40 people for committing genocide. And Rwanda has, you know, 20,000 people in jail. Well, that, you know, doesn't get us anywhere closer to getting these 800,000 people back who were killed, right? There's absolutely no doubt that uh, genocide is the kind of crime that we can't afford to, you know, to, to, to see, to, to, to have committed. I mean, we can't afford to have any crime committed, but I think it's particularly true with uh, genocide. So you want to detect this early on, and you want to be able to step in, okay? Um, there's several problems with that, right? First, the genocide, you know, it's going to happen on the surface of the earth. It's going to happen in a sovereign state, right? That's our perhaps our biggest problem. It's going to happen on the territory of the state. Most likely, it's going to happen because the government of that state is the one doing the genocide, right? It's not private companies that commit genocide. They might be complicit, but, you know, actually genocide requires significant access to violence. Who has significant access to violence? Typically the state, right? There's a logistical element. The Nazis had the train, they had the, the chemicals, they had the industry, they had the, the army, the police, etc., to round up people across Europe. Uh, two weeks before the beginning of the Rwandan genocide, um, there was a kind of whistleblower, a Rwandan whistleblower, who came to General Romeo Dallaire's camp and said, look, I have to tell you something. Uh, we have just received, uh, I think it was 10,000, a delivery of 10,000 machetes, right, in crates from China or somewhere. And he said, well, we don't need that much. Like, there's no reason why these are arriving now, right? Uh, and the suspicion, and this was, of course, in a very fraud, tense context was, these machetes were being flown in to be distributed to the population and, and, and you know, the, the, the kind of civil servants, etc., to carry out massacres. Right? Um, the problem is a sovereign state traditionally does what it wants on its territory. You can't just sort of move in. You can't send your own army. You can't send, you know, so it's, and plus, the state does a lot of things that it quite confidentially these days, most states or most groups that want to carry out a genocide will not broadcast it publicly. I mean, even in the days of the Holocaust of the Armenian uh, genocide, there's a lot of covering your tracks, right? And if you're caught red-handed, it's never genocide, right? What's the favorite excuse of uh, people who commit genocide? I think. Uh, Anyone with Armenian roots? What are, what's, yeah? It was wartime, right? Um, there's, they're always gonna seize as a pretext for fact that, and it's the same thing in Darfur, right? It's, we're not, this isn't genocide. It's an armed conflict. You know, maybe there were, you know, a little excess killing, but this was a conflict between equals, it's a war, it's a completely different logic. We're not out there to just kill the entire group. We're having a bona fide 
armed a conflict or war between parties. Right? That makes it look much less grave. And historians of uh, the Ottoman Empire and Turkey and, and Armenia are still bickering about these issues you know, a century later. Right? Um, okay, so just to be, um, just to be clear, um, things always look simpler and, and more evident in retrospect. With the benefit of hindsight, with the knowledge that we have now, um, it's easier for us to sort of point the finger at something and say, that's genocide. Okay? Um, there was a moment in 1940, 1941, 1942, where that, you know, that, apart from the fact that the word didn't really exist, just kind of understanding the radicality of what was happening in the midst of these, you know, otherwise highly civilized European societies, etc., uh, you know, would have taken very significant skills. Um, and, and, you know, few people were in a position, the allies maybe, but, and, and the victims, of course, right? I mean, who realized what was going on? It's for people arriving in Auschwitz, right? And, but although sometimes, you know, until the last second, right, they didn't, because, you know, part of the subterfuge of the Holocaust was, uh, sort of hiding what was at stake, right? So the, the sort of a labor camp uh, myth, right? To the victims until uh, it was too late, okay? So that's going to be really one of the challenges, distinguishing genocide from war. And, uh, and, and distinguishing genocide from war, by the way, is difficult because there could be a war and genocide. The two are not incompatible, right? So for example, in Rwanda, in 1994, there is a war, right? The, uh, the, the, the plane of a president has just been downed by a missile, he's killed, uh, there's a, an armed group, the, uh, the FPR that's in Uganda, they're moving in, they're super trained, equipped, you know, sort of they're, they're moving fast into Rwanda, and the government of Rwanda is very much against them and is fighting them. So you might, so the myth, I think the kind of revisionist myth is, this was a war, they, you know, no, no, we never set out to kill the Tutsis as a group in the kind of genocidal way that you say we did. All we were doing was fighting the FPR, and yes, they're, you know, which is the rebel group, their allies in, in the country. Because all Tutsis, it's known, were supporting the FPR. So they were like, almost like combatants, right? And this is how you deny genocide. It's also how you get people to commit genocide, right? Because it's not necessarily always a kind of great selling proposition to go to your military and say, we need you to commit genocide. You'd be surprised at the natural reluctance of people to kill children, right? I mean, to kill civilians. It takes a lot. You need to desensitize people. You need to, you need to prepare your own, right? Not everyone was a rabid, you know, hyper-Nazi, even among the Wehrmacht, etc. I mean, in fact, there were people who were sort of removed from the front because they were too, you know, too unwilling to carry out massacres. So the, the, the regime was choosing, you know, its execution as well, etc. Um, so now, how was, he, how was it doing that? Well, often, I mean, of course, there's a certain type of sadists and kind of torturers who are kind of fine with committing genocide, but a lot, they, you know, they would in, invent stories about, you know, if you don't kill them, they'll kill you, this is a fight to the death, you know, like the Bolsheviks will come in, and so, they, you know, they, there's, uh, this is why after the Second World War, I, I mean, you know, amongst some Germans, there was, it was a challenge, right, to understand what had really been going on, because a lot of the propaganda was there to sort of desensitize them to what was uh, being done in their name, okay? I'm not saying that this is something you can't overcome, right? We, we um, some people saw through the lies, including in Rwanda, including in, in Germany. There are people in Rwanda who are uh, Hutus, who save their Tutsi neighbors. Uh, there were, you know, quite often, um, you know, one of the things that genocidal regimes hate is people who fall in love and marry people from the other group. One of the first prohibitions of the Nuremberg laws was Jews cannot marry Aryans, right? 
during the Rwanda genocide, a lot of Hutu wives or husbands saving their Tutsi wives or husbands and relatives, etc. So, because what's interesting, of course, is that groups are porous at the border. Right? No group is constant. Groups mingle. That was what happened in Bosnia as well. Right? Why, would, why did Sarajevo fight back against the genocidal impulse? Because Sarajevo was, the, it was a, you know, the big city in Bosnia to where uh, there was most intermarriage. Serbs had married Croats, had married Muslims, had mixed children. Mixed children, you know, they can't sort of kill a half of themselves, right? So they're a natural antidote to, to genocide, right? Partly because their allegiances are mixed, but partly because they show that you know the the, the the contours of groups are often uh, uh, fuzzy at at, at at the edges. All right. So how do you detect? Well, there's a lot of work on that tries to explore the idea that genocides don't happen overnight. It may seem as if they happen overnight, right? So you look at Rwanda. You're on a you know in in uh, early May in Kigali, you might think, you know, everything's normal. It's a little tense, maybe, but you wouldn't necessarily, if you were a foreigner and you just arrived, you wouldn't necessarily detect anything on tour, right? And when the plane crashes, the president of Rwanda is killed, and within hours, there's roadblocks throughout Rwanda, throughout Rwanda, in the smallest village, roadblocks. And they're waiting at the roadblocks with their machetes, and you drive past or you walk past. They take your ID. They don't like how you how you look. They think you look like you're more kind of Ethiopian looking rather than Bantu looking. You're dead. Okay. And they have the machetes. And somehow all of these people, because this isn't a genocide that's carried out uh, just by the army of the police. It's like the local mayor and his secretary. And, and, you know, the janitor, and everyone is involved, right? How did they know, right? They knew because this had been prepared for months, if not years. There had been rehearsal massacres. There had been lists that were drawn up. These are the people that you're going to kill when we give you the signal. This happened very quickly. Just imagine, this is 800,000 people being killed in one month. So, um, because it doesn't happen overnight, you begin to look for these telltale signs that something pathological is, is happening politically uh, and that people are preparing for something. So there's all kinds of risk factors, um, you know, I'm tempted to say that sort of fragile states occasionally allow genocidal ideologies to take root, although a very strong state can also be uh, extremely ex exterminatory. Conflict, for sure, right? So not always. I mean, you couldn't say that there was a conflict, except maybe in the mind of Nazis, but between uh, Germany and the Jews, right? Uh, but in Rwanda, there was a conflict. Uh, and and that in, in the Ottoman Empire, there was, you know, following the first, cult, the, the, the first World War, there were clashes, there was a, right? So that creates an environment in which, you know, things, uh, um, it might be easier to sort of, under the cover of war, uh, to carry out uh, genocide. Human rights violations. So you could see, you could say that genocide is the ultimate human rights violation. You start by attacking the individual, discriminating against them, depriving them of their rights. And you try, and you see what society will accept. Yeah, we're going to try to ban this group from his profession. Let's see what happens. Let's see if other states complain, if anyone is bothered by this. Oh, seems we just got away with it. Let's push this a little more. Now, let's send you know, all the men of a certain age of that group to a camp. Let's see what happens. Yeah? Let's see how our population deals with it, whether it makes us more popular, etc. And so you can see how human rights violations basically prepare the ground and they make these people very vulnerable. Because right? if you don't have rights, ultimately you lose even the right to life. Right? And you can't fight back right, in, a, in society. Or the only way you can fight is by taking up arms, as some 
genocidal targets have done uh, historically. Then really important propaganda. Okay, this is, propaganda is not secret. The messages are often there and they're kind of loud and they can be heard. Radio Mille Collines, uh, um, in a, or German radio, uh, uh, before the, the genocides were extremely active. And so there's, there's a whole series of things that propaganda does, but typically, you know, scholars suggest that it's the dehumanizing of the victim that is crucial to allowing the implementation of a genocide. It's not, please go and kill your sort of brothers and sisters, right? It's, please go and kill these subhuman creatures, right? And literally subhuman. Right? So, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, you see the, um, the metaphors and the images being used in the 1930s in Germany or in Rwanda, pre-1994, are all about saying, in the case of the Tutsis, the favorite insult is their cockroaches. This is all over the place, in, in pop songs, etc. They're cockroaches. They're not human. They're, what you know, separates us from uh, them from us is much more important than what we have in common. And there's all these tales also, by the way, I mean, obviously genocidal projects often thrive on extreme nationalism. Extreme nationalism is the idea that a nation has to be a homogeneous group uh, if it's to be a nation at all. And so foreign bodies have to be expunged. There's this that whole sort of organic register, right? So the, the foreigner is like a microbe or he's a, 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 you know, a, a virus or something that has to be pushed out. So, you know, again, so in, 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 in obviously very clear with the Nazis, but also clear in Rwanda, right? The idea there, by the way, was that the Hutus were the only proper inhabitants of Rwanda. And the Tutsis, who were the former kings of, of Rwanda, had arrived a few centuries ago down the Nile, um, you know, and, and really had nothing, no place in contemporary Rwanda. It was, of course, completely a fabrication that the colonizers had invented, but which sort of post-colonial Rwanda basically uh, recycled. All right, don't need to go into too much detail here. I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. Um, Five more minutes. I'm going to skip the, the stages of, of genocide because I think we've uh, covered that. Uh, so what can we do concretely in terms of prevention? There's, there's all kinds of things. So you, could, you could stop the propaganda, for example, by there's a debate in 1994 about basically um, uh, you know, interfering with a signal of a radio. Right? Stop them from disseminating their hatred. But you can't always uh, do that, obviously. Um, one thing from a criminal law point of view that you might want to do is, I mean, you want to sort of nip this in the bud before it becomes a genocide, right? So you need, you can't afford for the crime to have been committed. Well, how do we do that in criminal law? We criminalize uh, incitement or we criminalize conspiracy, right? Conspiracy is if you sort of get together with others to decide to commit a crime, you're gonna rob a bank, the police overhear you, they can arrest you right he here and there for conspiracy to rob the bank. They don't have to wait, you know, next to the bank until you sort of have done the deed, right? Very useful. Right? So there's a lot of offenses, terrorism, etc. We can't wait for the crime to have been committed. So conspiracy, attempt, uh, but also incitement. Incitement is a bit tricky because incitement is when you just tell someone to do something, right? So the only crime is advocating, supporting something, right? What is that, I mean, why would that be tricky? In the US, for example, or in Canada, but more so in the US. What's at stake? Yeah, free speech, right? Freedom of expression, right? So, obviously the, the, the First Amendment in the US is a very extreme concept of free speech. You should be able to, you know, my free speech includes my right as a, you know, a member of the Ku Klux Klan to sort of parade through a black neighborhood. That's, you know, kind of, that's how far they take it. Okay, but what if that, you kind of free shape that as 
not just hate speech, but uh, it's possibly incitement to genocide, which it may well be in some cases. I mean, you'd have to prove it, obviously, uh, but it might be helpful. Encouraging whistleblowers, disobeyers. You want to break the ranks of a, of a genocidal regime by encouraging people to sort of to leave to, to jump ship. Um, we and then, then there's a whole sort of international structure. We now have uh, we have networks of genocide detection. We have a special rapporteur of, of that reports directly to the Security Council on genocide. So you're creating a whole structure to make sure that at the very least, no one can say that they were not war. Right? Unfortunately, we know that sometimes states and, and, and leaders have been warned and still not done anything. All right, now very briefly, just uh, uh, there's two things, intervention and repression. Um, the idea of intervention is sometimes it's too late to prevent or to prevent long in advance. Sometimes the genocide is actually happening. And that raises the question of, well, what do we do now, right? Um, you know, it's too late to prosecute people, what can we do? Obviously, if you're talking about intervening and using force, presumably in, the, in another state, you've suddenly raised the bar a lot because you're not supposed to do that normally. You're not supposed to send in the troops in another state, right? So it really ought to be a last resort, uh, but maybe it's necessary. So the question may arise first because you already have peacekeepers on the ground. That happened in Bosnia. It happened in Rwanda, right? So you, you, you all know General Romeo Dallaire. That was the whole cause of his you know, angst of, at the time. And what should I do? Because he had troops. Right? Canadian troops, right? were Belgium troops, were, uh, uh, Senegalese troops, right? they were Pakistani, they were all there. The question is, they weren't there to prevent the genocide, they were there to enforce a peace that never really happened. But you know, they've got weapons, they're military, they're trained, and so the question is, well, what do we do? And some protected uh, fleeing populations, I said, you know what, we're, because We've got guns and we look like we know what we're doing. The, the kind of genocide with the machetes, they're, they're no match, they'll sort of leave us peace. Others just departed. You know, there are quite a few peacekeepers who were killed, uh, and their states, just Belgium in particular, just, just said, we're pulling everyone out. Right? But as a result, probably a lot more people were killed. Um, so the next thing is, if you don't have peacekeepers, you need to send in the troops. And I'll, you know, maybe I'll take questions on that because I've been talking for too long. But you need the Security Council. You'll probably have heard of R2P. It's, a very, it's very difficult to not get a veto at the Security Council uh, when it matters. We had bombing in Libya, uh, which was ordered maybe not to prevent a genocide, but certainly to prevent ma impending massacres. But that is very contested. Right? Russians and the Chinese sort of went with it half-heartedly, very unhappy afterwards because they had the impression that this whole let's prevent genocide rhetoric was then used to kind of change the regime, which is what, what sort of the, the Western states wanted to do. But there's always going to be that suspicion as well that uh, you know most interventions, uh, military interventions in other countries are not justified by saying, oh, well, we just wanted to grab you know, whatever that country had or sort of dominate them. It's always humanitarian. Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia to protect the German minority in Czechoslovakia. So he described it as a humanitarian intervention, right? very, you know, ironically. Uh, but we have to be a little careful that, you know, there's a long history of intervening, you know, of strong states intervening in weak states for humanitarian reasons, okay? Um, and of course, it might just make the problem worse. So we don't know, right? Kosovo, was it right to bomb Serbia for what were portrayed as massacres that were about to happen? Kosovo, maybe, but I mean, there's a problem there because if you stop a genocide, you'll never know what would have happened, right? And you'll get blame for whoever got killed in the process of saving people from genocide. And people will say, no, no, but the, the Albanians, you know, the, the, sorry, the, the Serbs never intended to commit genocide, which was overreaction, which was NATO, you know, asserting, you know, its sphere of power, etc. So it's going to be very tricky. So why don't, why don't we have a few uh, questions for you? Thank, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you.
I can circulate the microphone, maybe. Let me. So I was wondering why you think or what your opinion or thought process on why certain genocides get more attention and more of an exposure than other ones. For example, the Japano, like the Japano-Korean ones over the, over the millennia and, for ex and Japan, uh, China ones, or the Japan-China ones and even, even something that's in Europe like the Soviets and the Ukrainians. Why do you think those would get more exposure than other ones, such as the World War II? What? Trying to address this one. I mean, it's a complex question, and there, there is a bit of, uh, you know, one French author used the expression, la compétition mémorielle, you know, that different groups are sort of competing for sort of a certain recognition, and, and you know, for, uh, the kind of degree of suffering they were exposed to. Obviously, the attention that uh, different genocides get may vary depending on the region. So obviously, people in Korea or China are very attuned to uh, uh, Japanese violence uh, in uh, before and during the, uh, the Second World War. Um, I think the Holocaust is a bit of a special case. Uh, you know, I think because of the it's so prototypically genocidal. It's so, you know, the, the, the kind of industrial dimension, etc. So if you think of, so people say, well, you know, there were more casualties in Ukraine, right? So during the Soviet Union, the famines, or, you know, even the Great Leap. I mean, you're talking about millions of people dying. Um, and that's true. I mean, I think there's probably, and I don't, I'm, I'm not talking as a lawyer here, and I, I'm not really a historian, but there's maybe a bit of a difference between uh, when I say this, it's, it's, it's complex, right? But sort of completely failed social experiments, the goal of which, you know, so I mean, if, if you think of, of Ukraine, it's a lot of, there's famine, right? There's famine because of collectivization, etc. It's a little different from, I think, taking people to the gas chambers, but maybe, you know, you could argue not that different, but there's, um, so there's, you know, a, a level of indirectness that might explain partly, I think, uh, the difference in focus. Having said that, I think we should be constantly sort of reassessing these things. So, for example, the rediscovery of a killing of the Hereros as, you know, very important to the history of genocide, right? This, and this was Germany already, right? So there was something, and and they were they experimented with certain things in the colonies, uh, which, you know, then they developed tools, right? I mean, there, there's circulation of ideas and practices. I mean, another example is, um, you know, even the British, you know, all kinds of colonial wars. Uh, but, you know, and, and including during the Boer War, right? The origin of a concentration camp. Who invented the concentration camp? It was the British in sort of counterinsurgency war in South, Af with, you know, in South Africa, uh, who sort of, you know, rounded up kind of the, the, uh, the, the Boer and sort of put them in places where they, you know, died a slow death. Um, so, yeah, thank, thanks for your question. Uh, well, you said that even if you're able to prevent a genocide, there's still a possibility that you'd be blamed because, like, you may kill some people and then you don't, like, you'll still be blamed for the killing of those few people because you won't know, like, the outcome, like, if the genocide would have happened. But there's still evidence, like, there's still planning that went around the whole, the whole genocide. So wouldn't that evidence be enough to kind of, like, say that it was happening, like, to prevent the blaming? Should we be watching out for anything right now? Like, do you think Trump is capable of genocide? Like, what should we be keeping an eye out for? Um, 
Uh, interesting questions, challenging questions. All right, so, uh, yeah, so the idea of conspiracy is not a single, theor theoretically, right, but uh, it might be that not a single person has been killed. The, the, you know, the UN has uncovered a plan uh, to destroy a group as such, and I think uh, clearly what's important is we don't have to wait for genocide to have been committed to prosecute people. Even the beginning of realization, of implementation of a genocidal plan would be enough. There's all kinds of other challenges to repression, right? I mean, what court has jurisdiction? Will the ICC, the International Criminal Court, have jurisdiction? It's not obvious, right? Typically, states that are going to commit genocide are not going to ratify the Rome Statute and risk having their leaders prosecuted. So you need a Security Council referral, but for that, you need, you know, there has to be no veto, okay? Um, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So the veto is pretty effective at stopping uh, interventions, including interventions to stop whether it's genocide or massacres or crimes against humanity or a sort of massive campaign of war crimes. Um, so what can what can we do? I mean, sort of two or three answers to that. You know, one of them, we can reform the council, which we've been trying to do for the last 20 years. Uh, and which is a bit difficult because obviously uh, the permanent members don't want to give up their veto. A second is you can occasionally decide to go at it alone without Security Council authorization, which is what uh, NATO did in Kosovo. They kind of offered a resolution to the Security Council, the Russians and the Chinese vetoed it. They said, doesn't matter, we're still going to go ahead with a plan. That's great at some level, very dangerous as a precedent at another level. Why? I'll just give you an example. Who loves the language of the responsibility to protect right now? It's Putin when he's moving into Crimea to protect ethnic Russians, right, from violence. I mean, it's not necessarily the language of genocide, but, right, so you're providing tools, right? So, I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to remedy Know, deal with a problem of genocide without handing over a tool for every tyrant to sort of feel that, you know, he now has a sort of open invitation to go and protect uh, people uh, anywhere. And, I, you know, I don't particularly think that, I don't know, I mean, the genocide is, is complex. Um, there's one or two things that one can say about the US or great powers. One of them is the availability of nuclear weapons. Um, I think puts the question of genocide under a different light, right? Because you, they're inherently undiscriminating weapons. So the, the, the line between pursuing a war and